Well, how's everyone doing today? Come on. Oh, yeah, so excited to be here. I'm ready to teach today, and I hope you are ready to receive today, okay? Uh, hey, for those of you that are watching online, just want to give a shout out to you. Cindy Brazen down in Florida now, and I'm uh, just so excited that you guys are watching online. Also, for those of you that um, maybe are here for the very first time, we just wanted to say thank you for coming and taking a risk to try something new. We're so excited that you are here. Um, we have this little thing that we call, it's a, it's a, it's a three-week challenge. And it's, it's basically uh, this idea of uh, you can't just do things, you just can't come, 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 you just can't come once to figure things out. You have to come a few weeks in a row. And so we just want to encourage you to come on back over the next a uh, few weeks. And so uh, today we're in our series called Travel Light, and we're talking about the idea of, of how, just, how just letting go of things that can just weigh us down. And today we're talking about the idea of letting go of distractions. <laughs> you ever just get distracted, you know what I mean? You ever just find it so hard? <laughs> you know, sometimes we try things, you know, or you, know, you just go for it. <laughs> and uh, you ever find it hard sometimes to let go of distractions? You ever have it, is it just hard sometimes to just focus? You know, maybe just in this last few moments, it can be so hard to focus. I know every week when I'm preparing this talk, uh, it's so easy for me to get distracted. It takes on average about 15 hours or so a week to kind of put this kind of a talk together uh, from the research to just preparing, asking God what does he want to do and, uh, and, and the practice and the rehearsing and all that goes into it. And so when I'm, when I'm writing my talks, I, I've got to have everything just so. I, I, I've got to get into my spot. I've got to, you know, have the computer. I've got to have my drink. I've got to have the light set at a certain, you know, temperature in the room, you know, the whole thing. And then if anything gets off, it's like it's not good for me. And, and I get distracted and the things don't go as well. You guys ever have a hard time focusing? You guys ever have a hard time focusing when I'm talking? <laughs> don't raise your hand. You're not supposed to laugh. What the heck? You guys ever just wonder sometimes, like, man, you're wondering what, like, what you're going to eat, maybe, or when is he going to get a haircut, or, you know, just, you know, sometimes I have a hard time focusing when I'm up here, because you guys are really distracting, you know? Are you taking notes, or are you just scrolling through Instagram, okay? Or, uh, or when you get up to leave, you know, to leave the, the, you know, the room, or, or, I, is it something I said, or you just got to go to the bathroom, you know? Or, or when I see someone sleeping. Am I that bad? Okay, is it that bad? Okay, I'm sorry, you know. Sometimes it's just hard for us to focus. And so um, this idea of letting go of the distractions that can weigh us down. The word distraction comes from a Latin word in 1519, or, or 1590 rather. It says a distraction is a pulling apart, a separating, a drawing of the mind in a different direction. So your mind's trying to go this way, and all of a sudden it pulls you into another way. If you didn't know this, whether you're a Jesus follower or not in the room, you're exploring your faith, you need to know that there's a real, this is real truth here, that there is an enemy. All forces of hell are trying to distract you, to take you off course, to divide you, to separate your mind. And that's the devil. And he's trying to literally distract you. Uh, I heard it said a long time ago, uh, just drink this in for yourself. The devil doesn't need to destroy you if he can distract you. Let's let that sink in. In fact, let's just save that together to get it into our veins, okay? The devil doesn't need to destroy you if he can distract you. Isn't that the truth? He literally wants to literally numb you or neutralize you to get you off course for what is best for your life. And so today we're talking about trying to let go of the distractions that weigh us down that could ultimately destroy us and the idea of how it's so worth the fight to focus because there's so much at stake for your life and others' lives for us not to get distracted but to fight for focus. And so that's what we're going to dive into today. But before we do, I want to pray for you and pray for me. Father, thank you uh, for gathering us here in this room today. And I ask, I ask, I ask, I ask, in the name of your son, that you would remove the distractions in our minds, that you would allow us, we were here, we made it, to just zone in on what you want to teach us today. We want to hear from you today. That's why we got up. That's why we got ready to come. And so, Father, help us not to be distracted. Father, help my mind not to be distracted. Help my tongue not to be distracted uh, as I communicate. Thank you for the, uh, the, uh, the privilege and the opportunity I have to do this today. And I just pray this in the power of your son's amazing, beautiful name, Jesus. 
Amen. Amen. Letting go of the distractions that are so that can so easily push us in a wrong direction and ultimately destroy us. To kind of kick things off, I want to start off um, with a story, uh, a real historical event that happened 2,000 years ago uh, when Jesus was on this earth, and there was two sisters that were hosting what seemed to be a dinner party. We find this in Luke chapter 10, uh, starting in verse 38. We'll put it up here on the screen for you. It says, as Jesus and his disciples were on their way, he came to a village where a woman named Martha opened her home to him. She had a sister called Mary who sat at the Lord's feet listening to what he said. But Martha was, say this with me, distracted by all the preparations that had to be made. Now, before, uh, you know, Martha always gets a bad rap in this story. You know, everyone always picks on Martha. But can we just hold on for one second? Uh, By raise of hands, how many of you hosted Thanksgiving this year at your house, okay? So all of you understand, right, the pressure and the distractions by the preparations. Now, let's just say that last minute you found out that Jesus was showing up to the party, okay? Wouldn't your anxiety level just kind of burst through the ceiling a little bit, making sure the casserole's in at the right time and comes out at the right time, that the candles are lit, that, that, that the drinks are filled, that all the decorations are just so. You would be in the same situation, being distracted by all of the preparations that were being made. And so here's Martha running around, trying to make sure everything is so. And then she's looking at her sister, who's just literally sitting and chilling and not doing anything. And some of you know who exactly who I'm talking about this weekend. They're just sitting on their butt doing nothing and just expecting a Tupperware filled with wonderful, glorious food on their way out. You know who that person is, and if you don't, maybe it was you. Okay, so here's what happens. Let's go to the next slide here. It says that she came to Jesus saying, hey, uh, Lord, don't you care that my no good, lazy, blank sister has left me to the work by myself? Would you tell her to help me? I mean, come on. And now again, let's, can we just, I need to just shout out for one second. We just got to give a shout out to all the Marthas in the room because the Marthas in the room are what keep this world going. The Marthas in the room is the reason why you ate, is the reason why you were able to pay the bills and maybe how you, the reason why you have a job. Just imagine if the world was ran by a bunch of Marys. We'd all starve to death, okay? So again, shout out to all the Marthas in the room. And then check this out. Jesus, in such a loving, loving way, responds to Martha like this. Check this out. He says this, Martha, Martha, the Lord answered, you are worried and upset. In another translation, it says distracted. You're worried that you're upset. You're distracted about many things, but few things are needed or indeed only one. Now, Mary has chosen what is better and it will not be taken away for her. Martha, he says, Martha, you have a good heart. You have a great heart, but you are distracted. And in the same way, as I study this this week, it made me think that maybe God is calling out to me saying, Travis, Travis, you have a good heart, but you are distracted. And maybe he's calling out to you right now, fill in your name. Jesse, Jesse, Peter, Peter, Kevin, Kevin. You have a good heart, but you're distracted. You're distracted by things that don't matter the most. You're you're putting so much emphasis on things that are not important. Now, not that any of those things that Martha was doing was wrong. They weren't wrong, but they just weren't the best for her. So often, so often the most difficult choices aren't between good and bad, but between good and best right? Let let me, let me repeat that. So often the most difficult choices aren't between good and bad, but between the good and the best. Would you repeat after me? Not bad, but not the best. Let's do it again with a little more emphasis. Not bad, but not the best. Not bad, but not the best. Isn't it so true how the enemy, if he can't make you bad, he will distract you to then ultimately destroy you. And so we, as people, have to fight to choose what is best for us so that we can travel lighter and not let the distractions weigh us down. So here's three thoughts, three ways to help us choose 
what's best for our lives. The first thing that we've got to do is we've got to diminish the distractions. Say that with me. Diminish the distractions. We have to distance ourselves from the things that are tempting us and getting us off, off the beaten path. Uh, Paul, uh, who, who wrote a majority of the New Testament, uh, his life was literally turned upside down when he realized how much God loved him. And he was, he was a, a Christian hater, but then, man, he became one of the most uh, powerful, uh, most uh, uh, um, uh, um, just uh, amazing church starters all uh, across uh, Europe back in that day. And what was so amazing is, 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 is here's what he says. And, 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 and in this context in 1 Corinthians, he's talking about relationships and he's talking about a, like a marriage. But I want us to put it into the context of what we're talking about today. And here's what he says. He says this in 1 Corinthians 7.35. I'm saying this for your benefit, not to place restrictions on you. I want you to do whatever will help you serve the Lord best with as few, say this with me, distractions as possible. I want you to do whatever will help you serve the Lord best with as few distractions as possible. All of us, it's so easy, right, to get distracted. And one of the things that all of us have probably in common, the thing that distracts us the most in this room is this thing right here. Okay, right? We all know it. It distracts us. And what's so amazing is that this thing has only been around for less than two decades. But for thousands Upon thousands, upon thousands, upon thousands of years, the human race survived without it. And now today, if we go just like a few feet away from our phone, we start to panic. Where's my phone? Where's my phone? Where's it at? And we, don't touch my phone. This is mine. My precious. And we just are like, give me the phone. Don't touch it. Sometimes I play tricks on our staff and I steal their phones and they panic and I like to watch their panic in their eyes and it's like, where's my phone? Where's my phone? And we get so paranoid without our phones and we get so consumed and it's so distracting. Now these phones are amazing because they help us be more productive, right? But sometimes these things actually keep us from being productive in the things that matter the most. Like for instance, if we are, uh, have, a, have a, a homework assignment or a project or finals are coming up or we have this work project that really deserves our all and we've got to give one of our best presentations and so we're working on it and we're in the zone and then all of a sudden we're pulled away from that important project that needs to get done and then we're zoning in. Okay, what did they say? Oh my goodness, okay. All right, and then we get back in. But the process of getting back in and getting back into the zone has delayed us and it's actually causing us to not be as productive. Let's talk about relationships that matter the most in our, in our lives. With our spouses, our significant other, our children. We, we, you know, we, we, we come home and we're with our kids all day and, and, and we're there to, to encourage them and inspire them and, and help them with their homework and, and, and just to be with them and hear what's going on in their lives and, and, and to, uh, to just to hang with them and to play with them. And then maybe you're just hanging with them and then all of a sudden, hey, dad, it's your turn. Hold, hold on, hold on. Dad, but it's, it's, it's your turn. I said, hold on. And we get distracted by the things that matter the most. Or let's talk about our relationship with God. Trying to communicate to the, to the king of the universe. And we're like, Father, just, I, know, I, just, I love you so much. Just, I ask that you would help me with this day to just, to just say what you need me to say. And then just, Father, she said, What? And then, Father, God, you're just such an amazing God. God, just help me not to just be distracted by all the things. And we do this. And this thing can just completely distract us from the things that are most important to our lives. Repeat after me. Not bad, but maybe not the best. Maybe not the best. And since you all are so quiet right now, maybe we'll just keep digging in here, okay, on this idea. It's maybe hitting some nerves. It's hitting my nerves here, okay? Let's talk about social media. If you have one of these devices, on average, an average person spends two hours a day scrolling through social media. You add it up, that's two days a month. If you start at a young age, some predict that you could spend seven years of your life tapping 
and scrolling? Did I get a like? Did I not get a like? How was the filter going back? When Apple came out with the screen time feature to say how many how much time you're spending on the certain apps, and I looked at it, I mean, I just had to repent. Like, are you kidding me? I'm spending that much time? Some of us need to put limits. Some of us need to delete some apps because it's distracting us. One of the practices this past year that I've been trying at, and I'm not always good at it, and I fail at it, but right when I come home, there's this little shelf, and I put my phone there, and I put it on silent. So I can be all in with my kids. And the days that I do it, it's great. But the days that I get slacked in it and then I go, I, I go to it, it distracts me from what's most important. We have to treat our distractions almost like they are a temptation. We have to, to literally look at our distractions almost like they are a temptation. Almost as Solomon said when he was talking about the moral, the, um, the um, a moral woman, when he said this, he says, stay away from her. Don't go near the door of her house. He says, stay away. Don't go near it. Put limits. He doesn't say, yeah, hey, you know, I mean, just, you know, maybe get a drink with her or maybe get in the back seat of the car. You know, he doesn't say that. He says, stay away. Don't go near. Set limits. Set boundaries. And so I don't know what it is for you. Maybe it is your phone that is the biggest distraction for you. Or maybe you need to buy some headphones because in your work you have some loud coworkers and you need some canceling headphones. I just want to take a moment to apologize to all the Mile City staff for all the times that I distract you from getting your work done. Maybe you need to get some headphones. Maybe it's a relationship that is distracting you, that is keeping you from what's best for your life. Solomon also says in Proverbs 13, 20, he says this, whoever walks with the wise becomes wise but the companion of fools will suffer harm. In the first year of our church, I really wanted this to sink in for everyone. I wanted everyone to just hold on to this and not forget it, so I wrote a little jingle. Maybe some of you remember it if you were here then. If you didn't, no worries. I'm going to teach you it again right now, okay? So I need everyone's help, okay? You're just going to go like this. Come on, help me out. Don't rush it. Stay on tempo, all right? You guys repeat after me, okay? Ready? Whoever walks with the wise becomes wise. You go. Whoever walks with the wise becomes wise. But the companion of fools will suffer harm. But the companion of fools will suffer harm. Give yourselves a hand. You're sounding good. Let it sink in. But listen, you don't need me to tell you this. In fact, you don't even need God to tell you this. You know. It's common sense. You walk with the wise, you'll be wise. You walk with the fools, you'll be a fool. And I'm not saying we never hang out with the fools. But your inner circle, the people that are sharpening you, if you are striving to figure out what it means to move towards God, and your inner circle is the people that are just giving you the advice and giving you your perspective and helping you make your choices, if they are not people that are striving and moving after Christ, then... You're a fool. Don't be a fool. Be wise. Walk with the wise. Some of you, I'm going to really get up in your business right now. Some of you are dating a distraction. You're dating a distraction. They're leading you into sin. He or she is doing something, leading you into things that you never, you shouldn't be doing. You know you shouldn't be doing. They're disrespecting you. They're not honoring your integrity. They're not honoring your purity. And it's time for you to move on. It's time for you to swipe left, delete, and upgrade. It's time. It's time. Don't, don't be a fool. And so we can go on and on and on and on about this, but... Um, I think we've got enough on, right? We've got to diminish the distractions to choose what's best for our lives. Number two, we've got to focus on what's important. And here's Solomon coming in clutch again in Proverbs chapter four. He says this, set your gaze on the path before you with, say this with me, fixed purpose, looking straight ahead, ignore life's distractions. What does he say? He says to set your gaze, to fix your purpose, 
When you mow the lawn and you want to get those straight lines, right? You got to fix your gaze. You got to, you got to, you got to set your, 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 you got to fix your purpose. You got to set your gaze. And then if you start to look around or if you have to move a toy out of the yard and then the lines get all messed up, we got to, if you want to just set your gaze, you got to fix your purpose. I, I, I love the author of Hebrews. He says that Jesus is the author. He's the perfecter of our faith. And so we set our gaze on the king, on Jesus. When I read this passage, it's hard for me not to think about when, when Jesus' closest friends were in a boat and Peter, and they were all looking out, and they saw Jesus coming, but he wasn't in the boat. How is he out there? What is he doing? He's literally walking on the water. And so what do they do? They literally get out. He, gets, he says, can I come? And then Peter gets out of the boat, and he begins to walk on the water, and he's got his gaze set on the prize. He's got his gaze set on Jesus, and he's coming towards him, and he's, it's unbelievable, this exciting moment. And then all of a sudden, what does he do? He starts to look to the left. He starts to look to the right, and he sees the wind, and he sees the waves, and then he begins to start sinking. And some of you, you're sinking because you feel overwhelmed. You feel less than. You feel like you can never arrive. You just feel so overwhelmed and you're sinking because you're distracted by the things that don't matter, by things that don't matter the most. And it's, you're looking at the wind, you're looking at the waves, and you are getting distracted. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 6, he said, seek ye first the kingdom of God, and all these things will be added unto you. He says, seek ye first, meaning put God first in all areas of your lives. We have to seek him first. It takes discipline to focus on him so that the distractions don't allow us to sink. So when we wake up in the morning, when you wake up in the morning, the first thing should not be Instagram. It should be the word of God. It should be God, I need you. And I'm not asking you to read a commentary. I, I, I'm asking you to just grab just a verse and chew on it in the morning when you're taking a shower, you're brushing your teeth. Let the word of God sink into your heart for say, this is your day, God. Use me. Help me to speak how you would want me to speak and act how you would want me to act. It takes discipline, doesn't it? It takes discipline. Set your gaze. The first of your day. The first of the week. That's why you're here. We come together and gather at a weekly gathering to realign, to recharge, to say, God, this week is yours. Align me, recharge me, refuel me. This week is yours. When God gives us an increase, all areas of our life, our finances, when God gives us a, a, an increase, we give back to him. We give back our tithe. We give a percentage back to him because of what he's done, and we trust him with every area of our lives, including our finances. The past couple of years, I've been giving God the first of my year by setting a time to fast, to say no to food for a period of time, to just say, God, this is your year. You have my life. How do you want to use me specifically this year? Help me to align my path for what you would have for me this year. Seek first the kingdom of God. Focus on what's important. And you know what's interesting about this? You never just fall into excellence. You, 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 you never just wander into righteousness. You never just by chance give God glory. You got to work for it. You got to be disciplined. We've got to set our eyes on the prize. We have to be disciplined and not let the distractions distract us from what's best for our lives. And so how do we choose what's best for our lives? We got to diminish the distractions. We've got to focus on what's important. And lastly, we got to listen to the voice of God. We got to listen to the voice of God. It's so hard to listen to the voice of God, isn't it? I can't be the only one. It's so hard to listen for the voice of God. Travis, how do you hear the voice of God? How do you hear from the voice of God? God. Isaiah chapter 30 verse 21 says this, and your ears shall hear a word behind you saying, this is the way. Walk in it. When you turn to the right or when you turn to the left, your 
ears shall hear a word behind you. I love this imagery. As we walk through our lives, setting the gaze on the prize, trying to avoid being distracted by things that don't matter. And all of a sudden we hear, hey, 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 hey. you could go here. You know, you, you could go over here, but you know what's best? is if you go this way. Listen. Listen. Yeah, but Travis, what, what am I listening for? There's so many ways we can listen to the voice of God. It can happen in moments like this. It, it, it can happen when we're listening to a song. It can happen through a person. It can happen through circumstance. But I tell you, I tell you, hear me, please hear me. The way that God, I believe, speaks the loudest in today's world, into our world, is right here. His word is alive and living, and it's speaking to us. And for those of you that are just kind of new to this whole idea, maybe this seems a little intimidating, or I'm reading words and it says these and thou's and I don't understand, get a translation. Download the YouVersion Bible app, New Living Translation, in a language that you can understand, and just start. Start in the book of John. Start in the book of Matthew, and just start to read. And I'm telling you, as you read it, it will speak to you in your circumstance. It will encourage you. It will inspire you. It will direct you. For those of you that have been following Jesus for a while, and I hear you talking, but I just can't seem to hear him. But you're not spending time with him. You're not consuming this. And if you really want to hear from the voice of God and you're like, God, where are you? I need to hear from you. Dive into his word. He is faithful to speak to you through his word. But yet we fill it up with a bunch of other stuff. Instead of his word. It's so important for us to fill up on God's word. That is how we can hear from him. Last year, I heard God speak to me in a small, still voice. Right now, I have four children under the age of nine. Nine, seven, five, and two. And, you know, it's a little distracting at the house when I come home from work, okay? And... I remember the days where I would come home from work and I could just have a conversation with Jen. Well, those days are gone, okay? It's like you can't like really have a conversation. You got to know when to have the conversation. And then some people are like, well, you need to, you need to, you know, just teach your kids manners. Okay, we, we did, but now it's just a bunch of distractions and interruptions with manners. Excuse me, dad. Excuse me, mom. Excuse me, dad. Excuse me, mom. Excuse me, excuse me. It's like, great, but it's still distracting. And it was just... I was getting frustrated and like it would bother me that I couldn't just have a conversation with Jen about what was going on that day. But then I heard that small, still voice. You're getting frustrated. You're getting distracted. You're getting overwhelmed. That's something that really doesn't matter because one day you're going to wish you were getting distracted by them. And one day you won't be. So enjoy the moment. Enjoy the moment. We have to choose what's best. And in order to do that, we have to diminish the distractions, focus on what's important, and listen to the voice of God. And why? Why? Like, why are we even talking about this? Why? Why? Well, this is why. Because your life and my life is way too valuable. And your calling. And my calling is way too great, and our God is way too good for us to get distracted away from what's best for our lives. Your life is way too valuable. Your calling is way too great to get distracted by things that don't matter. Martha, Martha. You have a good heart, but you're just distracted by things that don't matter. Travis, Travis, you got a good heart, but you're letting things that don't matter distract you. What are the things in your life that is distracting you away from what's best for you 
and that could ultimately destroy you? What are those things that you need to put limits on? Your life's too valuable. Your calling's too great. Our God is too good to allow our distractions to waste and destroy our lives. Let me pray for us. Well, as we close out our service, maybe for you, if you're honest, there's that thing that's distracting you. That is, maybe it's a relationship. Maybe it's a device. Maybe it's a video game. Whatever it is, you know what it is. And in this moment, maybe just as an act of worship, that you just say, okay, God, I'm going to take this time to think about what I can do to put a limit on it, to rearrange some things in my life. I, I, I want to I put some limits on that distraction. I, I need the courage. I need the boldness to make that change. If that's you, I just want to pray for you to say, that's me. I, 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 I want to I put a limit on that distraction in my life. Would you just raise your hand so I can just pray for you? Hands all over. Let me pray, Father, I ask in the power of your son's name, one, that you'd forgive us for allowing these things to distract us, take us off course for what's best for our life. God, give us the discipline to start a habit, to, to, to do specific things, to, to weed out that distraction that it wouldn't keep us from what's most important in our lives. We need your strength. We need your alertness. We need your courage to do so. As we continue to pray, maybe there's some of you that walked in today or maybe you've come a few times and you're just trying to process this whole idea of God and church. And Listen, I, I, I really want you right now to just lean into something for me. Don't get distracted. Hang here with me. This is maybe all you need to hear. If you're honest, you might be saying, you know, if I'm real, I'm not walking with God. I'm here maybe because I was dragged here or I feel like maybe I'm just supposed to be here. But the idea, I'm so distracted by the things of the world that the idea of fixing my eyes on Jesus is so foreign to me. And that's you. And, and that's where you're at. But you feel exhausted. And you feel drained. And you feel like you're sinking. And maybe this is what you need to hear today. Don't get distracted. Hear me clear. There is a great God who loves you so much, I can't even find a word to put to it. He, he loves you so much, he doesn't get distracted away from how much he loves you because he knows all the details of your life, every detail of your life. He zones in on you. He can't be distracted away from you. That's how much he loves you. The problem is, is that you've been disobedient, just like I've been disobedient. And so that's created a separation between you and this God that loves you so much. But he made a way. 2,000 years ago, as we begin to celebrate the Christmas season, he made a way. And he sent his son here to come on this earth, was born here grew up, lived a perfect life, did miracle after miracle, letting everyone know that he was the son of God, proof after proof, evidence after evidence. And then he died. And he rose again. And he died, why did he have to die? So that you wouldn't have to die for your disobedience. And he paid for your disobedience and my disobedience once and for all. And the scriptures say that if you get to the point where you realize, okay, I'm done being distracted by the world, I can't do anything about this disobedience. I want to be fixed. That if you put your faith in him, that he will erase all your disobedience. And you will spend eternity with the God that loves you so much. And so maybe that's you. Maybe, maybe, maybe this is all you needed to hear today. You just say, I'm done sinking. I'm done being distracted by the things of this world, and I want to set my eyes, my gaze on Jesus. 
If that's you, I'm not going to embarrass you. I'm not going to call you, but I just want to pray for you. If that's you, would you just so boldly just raise your hand and just say, that's me. I, I want to set my gaze on Jesus. Amen. Who else? Amen. Anyone else? Amen. You can put your hands down. I, I want to lead you into a real conversation with God. So you can just repeat this in the quietness of your heart right now. Just say, Father, here I am. I am tired of the distractions. Tell them. I'm tired of setting my gaze on things that are fading. Tell them. And today, I'm committing to set my gaze on you. Forgive me for my disobedience. Tell them that. Tell them, thank you for dying for me. Thank you for loving me so much to rise again for me. Tell them. I am making you, Jesus, the king of my life. As we continue to pray, if you truly meant that, the scriptures tell us that your life starts now, truly starts now, and it will last forever with the creator that loves you so much. Father, thank you so much for getting us back on track. Forgive us for going off the beaten path so many times. Forgive us for the stupid distractions that takes us away from things that aren't best for our lives. Thank you for caring enough to zone us back into what's most important. Oh, we're so thankful for the many, many chances and the mercy and the grace that you give us. We're so grateful. We love you and we pray this in the power of your son's name, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Well, hey, can we just give it up for those who put their faith in Jesus today for the first time? Amen. Hey, well, thank you for joining us at Mile City Online, where our vision is helping people move towards God. And maybe today you made a specific move towards God, and so we would love to help you on that journey. And so just text the word Faith Move to 77453, and one of our team members would love to have a conversation with you as you continue to move towards God. And remember, when you see a mile sign, pray for the Mile City.